Hello everyone, thank you for coming. Um, <laughs> my name is Cam Sandu and I'm one of the organisers of the Real Media Project. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about who we are, uh, we've been accused of being an NGO already, um, <laughs> but we're just a handful of independent journalists who have funded this via a small part of funding from the Network for Social Change and out of our own pockets. The reason that we started the Real Media Project is because we wanted to confront and tackle some of the largely unsaid but hugely harmful problems with the media. Certainly one of the things that made us challenges now is the unrelenting uh, coverage of UKIP and larger Farage over the last 12 to 18 months. As many of you know, um, Farage appeared on BBC's Question Time with no MPs, uh, more than the Play, Kimru, the SNP, the Green Party and the DUP combined, despite them having 17 MPs between them. Um, but further than that, Farage has been presented as some sort of alternative, uh, the voice of political dissent. Um, whereas the millions of voices of people who are fighting social injustice and political injustice have been blocked out of the media. The media continues to block out people who are immigrants, black people, young people, unemployed people, working class people. And this is systematic in the way the media is going to act in the run of the election. They could try and control the debate, particularly the Green Era and press, what Richard Shaw Dunn really talked about. Uh, people like Murdoch, who own the Sun, the Times, uh, Sky, and much, much more. Um, they're going to try and control the debate, the issues that we talk about, and real media is aiming to take back that debate and push the issues we care about to the forefront. Uh, so just some general announcements. We know that the People's Assembly are holding an event today, which we fully support, um, and we'll probably be joining them for some drinks afterwards and we'll probably to make it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, don't worry if you miss anything. Uh, we've got some cameras that are going to be recording, so you'll be able to catch stuff online later. Um, outside, on the left hand side, we've got some workshop spaces which are listed in the piece of paper you might have picked up at the front. And on the right hand side, we've got a networking space uh, where people can go in and talk to other people, make some connections. We wanted a space where people could <coughs> chill out, so please go in and check out some of the projects in there. Um, we we'll also have a film show upstairs from 3 to 5 pm, and that's the condition of the working class along with a QA with some of the people behind it. Um, just, we aren't providing any lunch, I'm afraid, but there is a library across the road uh, and there's some food available there if you do get hungry. Uh, coming up from Real Media, we do have an anti-daily mail week from the 13th to the 20th of March, uh, which you can find out more about from our Real Media Facebook page and Twitter page, where we've got an Indiegogo fundraiser, so check that out. Uh, and then we've also got the full launch of Real Media in April. Um, if you are going to be tweeting today, please use the hashtag uh, Real Media or at Real Media GB. Um, so, getting on to this opening plenary, we've got four brilliant speakers with us this morning. Um, very privileged to have them here. Each of them will be speaking for eight minutes, and then we've got a 15 minute QA. So, without further ado, uh, can I introduce Duncan McCarthy, who's a broadcaster and journalist on environmental issues. He's the author of several books, including his most recent, The Prostitute State How Britain's Democracy Has Been Born. Duncan. <laughs> Thank you very much, Cam, and uh, thank you very much for the invite to come up uh, to Manchester. Um, I want to do a couple of things today. I want to persuade you, as a former deputy chair of one of Britain's major political parties, that we don't live in a democracy, or we don't live in a liberal democracy. And secondly, I want to persuade you to try and come to London and sit on some um, uh, concrete for a week. Uh, so that's the my objective for today. Um, take a little step back. Why am I here? What's my journey? Uh, I'm sure all of you have, uh, if, if you were up here, you would have in equally interesting and relevant stories. Uh, in 1992, I was a, a ballet dancer. I didn't give a damn about the environment, I didn't give a damn about politics. I was doing a swallow dive one day on the uphouse stage, centre stage. My colleagues, not my friends, missed. So I hit the deck in 12 foot. I ended up in hospital. My therapist was going to the Amazon. Make long story short, I ended up with the Yanaman, Yanaman the Indians in the heart of the Amazon basin by myself without a cell phone. And saw firsthand the destruction of the, of the rainforest, but also became aware of the genocide. Uh, a genocide that started when our civilization arrived in the Amazon basin in the 17th century. There were 600,000, there were 6 million people living there then. There's now less than 600,000. And that genocide continues to this day. 28 shamans killed prior to Christmas last year. Came back to Britain, said, what can I do? 
And philosophically, I'm a Gandhian. And what, and what I mean by that is I believe that if I, I'm advocating change, I should do it myself. So I decided I need to bring my, my own lifestyle. Started doing that, um, bought a jar of organic ketchup, my first step. Um, 20 years later, my house is carbon negative. I have had a really bit of collection for waste for 20 years. My gas bill is 12 quid, um, my electricity bill is zero, basically. Uh, my water bill is around eight pounds other than standing charge per annum. Why am I telling you that? Uh, is it because I'm a smug Irish kid? <laughs> I am. But I actually want to say that uh, it's important, I think, the first step in any activism is putting our own house in order. And I put my house in order, and that's really important. Um, I think I'm involved in mainstream politics. I got elected as a local councillor, representing the Aylesbury estate, which is in the news at the moment, uh, for the outrageous reason it's being demolished, uh, to put in uh, private homes and losing social housing. I uh, got involved with Democrats, became a member of the, the uh, party's uh, federal executive, spent seven years there, then became deputy chair of the party for two years. I got more policy through uh, in terms of radical policy on the environment, uh, transnational corporations, etc., etc., and reforming the party, cleaning up its, its corruption. I spent 12 years doing that, very, very successful, got more stuff through conference than anybody did through the party. After 12 years, total waste of time. Complete, utter waste of time. Why? Because every single thing that was democratic passed by the conference committee, conference, by the conference, was not implemented by the people who, who were actually controlling the party, which are the political lobbyists and the donors and the tax haven people who were actually around the party leadership. So, seeing that from the inside and realising democracy is broken and corrupted and prostituted, I decided what can I do so I left mainstream politics. Decided to try and do my environmental activism in a different way. I started writing books about how to do green lifestyle, advised charities how to be green, I did a lot of uh, common independent. Spent a huge amount of time trying to persuade people on how to actually, buy, if we buy green, we might end up green lobbyists and help save the planet that way. Fast forward to 2011, Occupy asked me to come talk, and I saw firsthand uh, Occupy forced me to, to confront the reality that being a green guru, being a green, um, encouraging green, green um, consumerism, was as important and green if it's Gandhian, it wasn't going to have to deal with the issues of the planet and our democracy basis in time. Um, just two, two little points. The, the, government, the American government, NASA, has said that um, the Antarctic ice cap is now melting irreversibly, which means major cities across the world will in time be underwater. We have an out of time on climate change. And the other issue is I'm 55 years old, I'm 55 years of age. Um, the circle on this very um, elaborate graphic is all of wildlife, all of the um, nature that was on the planet when I was born uh, 55 years ago. What I mean by that, all the animals, plants, all the um, birds, fish, um, uh, 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 snakes, etc., etc., that were on the planet when I was born. In that time, we have lost 50% of them. We have lost half of nature in less than one person's lifetime. If I live another 30, 40 years, what are we going to end up with? Not in the last graphic. We might end up with maybe 5 or 10 percent at the rate we're consuming it. We can't go on as we are. And so therefore I thought, what can I do to actually tackle this? Everything I've done, mainstream politics, free guru, writing, etc., has, is not doing enough in time. So I decided to write a book about the corruption in our political system, so activists like you and, and other media like you could actually know about what the corruption is like from the inside. So I started writing a book three years ago, but as I started writing a book and, 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 and writing about the political corruption, we don't any longer have a political class. We have a political lobbying class. There are three pages in the book of senior level Democrats who are, or have been, or will be lobbyists. The clever also lobbyists. David Law's partner is a lobbyist. Um, Nick Campbell is a lobbyist. The, the, the chief executive has gone up to be a lobbyist. Um, I can go on and on and on. We saw from Rifkin and Straw this week, it is endemic. Straw and Rifkin are not the exception, they are the rule. Our, parts, our political system has been hired by corporate lobbyists. So, but I, I realized as I read that there are actually other, I came up with, I thought there was actually a prostitute state that, going on. And there are four pillars to it. 
First of all is a corrupted political system. The second pillar of that, of that prostitute state is our perverted academia. What I mean by that is that increasingly our research at universities uh, uh, is, being, is, being, is being funded by, by corporate um, sector. And our think tanks, the left wing and the centre and, and, and right wing think tanks, which are, have direct access to our legislative processes, are funded secretively by, by, the, by the corporate uh, uh, billionaire sector. The third pillar, which is I'm really interesting, that all three major political parties over the last decade have been funded by the tax saving system. Look at the funding of the Labour Party under Blair, um, the Liberal Democrats, and, and the Tory Party. Private equity up to its eyeballs, corporate um, uh, tax savings up to its eyeballs. And that's the third pillar, and that's hugely important in terms of the, the, the damage of um, austerity as a result of that, because actually by the rich not paying their taxes, it means that we are all suffering from, from having to pay higher taxes and lower public services. And most importantly, the, the debt from the third world is pouring into rich tax savings is one of the states of the rich state. And finally, the final pillar, the most important pillar why we are all here today, of the prostitute state, is the prostituted medium. The, when I started looking at it, I took the the stats. 80% of the papers and press that are sold every day in Britain is owned by five big right-wing extremist billionaires. And it's not only the press that they own, they own TV companies, they own the, the Harper Collins, they own the, um, the publishing company, they own the cinema company, they own the cinema production company, and, and, they, and even horrifically, they own the, the press agencies, the pre Press Association party owned by Murdoch, and Reuters is owned by the Thompson family billionaires. So therefore, almost everything that we see, hear, or listen to in our culture is affected by these five billionaires. And so therefore, the, the prostitute media is the most important pillar of the prostitute state. But if you look at the chair with four legs, if you think that there are four pairs of four legs, if you take one leg out, the chair becomes useless and it topples over. And that's why I believe passionately that the, the prostitute media is the one that we need to concentrate on. And in the Occupy movement, what we're actually um, focusing on now is that we're organizing an Occupy Rupert Murdoch week outside Rupert Murdoch's new glass uh, palace in, in, in London Bridge, outside the shore. He's left his bottom fortress in Oracle. And we actually there for a week at the end of March, and we want to use that with lots of nonviolent direct action and creative, we'll create protest and, and discussions and debates, etc. That the Occupy movement specialises in. We want to highlight the reason why you guys are creating an alternative media, and we think that there are three things to finish up. So I'll probably I'll run you over time. I think so. Yeah. So um, thank you. We think there are three solutions to tackling the prostitute state. The first is putting your own house in order. Are you subscribing to Sky? Are you shopping at Sainsbury's? Where are you, where are you buying your petrol from? Who are you buying your electricity from? But if you are doing all of those things, you are funding the lobbyists that are just trashing our democracy. Remember they've only power because our collective will is giving them our money. Step number one, your own, your own responsibility. Step number two is collective action, creating an alternative press, creating movements, creating uh, joining uh, political movements, joining any relevant NGOs, doing protests, etc. That's step number two. But we will not tackle the, the, the hijacking of our wealth and the destruction of our planet without mass non-violent direct action across the planet. Unfortunately, it's come to that. I don't want to do it, but it's, it's essential if we're going to do it. We uh, occupy the boxes in stadium stadium events in Parliament Square, and 44, sorry, we're now up to 56 of us being arrested for peacefully protesting in front of our, in front of our Parliament. In four months, I've been arrested four times for standing in front of our Parliament peacefully protesting. Once for having a folded sheet of plastic under my arm. The, the right to peaceful assembly has been taken, so what, those are the three things you need to do self, self empowerment, collective action, and non violent direction action. So please come to London in the end of March. Thank you very much. Thank you. We've got Samantha Asumazu, who's a documentary filmmaker and founder of Media Diversified, which is a non profit independent platform which seeks to promote and cultivate writers of colour, uh, creating challenging new content on inequality and justice. Samantha. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, great to be here. I wanted, just before I start, I wanted to actually just follow up on uh, Dominic's uh, speech very quickly. And that is to say, if you can, and you're interested in the news, which everybody is, and we're all affected, is to read the book Flat Earth News by Nick Davies. It's a little 
little bit older, but we on our platform, which is www.wediversified.org, boil down the points in that book. Um, it's called the Ten Rules of Journalism. It's exactly not what to do, but it's what you should be looking out for. One, run cheap stories. <coughs> Two, select safe facts. Three, avoid the electric fence. By, you know, watch out. Uh, rule four, select safe ideas. Rule five, always give both sides of the story. Rule six, give them what they want, as in us, if we're not critical. Uh, rule seven, the bias against truth. Rule eight, give them what they want to believe in, which is even more uh, uh, needs on hip happy, which you can do if you've got the track. And then rule nine, go with moral panic. Rule ten, ninja turtle syndrome, which is, uh, I don't know, how old you are, but I remember the Ninja, Ninja Turtles, and that was when you know, everybody gets on a, uh, on a bandwagon and you just get a complete you know, saturation within the, within the news about that one story, which we are currently getting with that bloody dress. I don't know if you've seen it, or I don't care about it, but I keep seeing it in my time, it's ridiculous. Anyway, so that was just to pull up because I thought it was fantastic, um, but I wanted to add that. Um, so I'm going to start. Today I'm going to say a few statistics, but I'm also going to sort of uh, give them a, a uh, circumference, I think. No, uh, give them a, a, a grounding with some uh, a grounding with some anecdotes uh, about um, just so that they're not you know, sitting there in this, this sort of netherworld void which statistics can sometimes do. So, firstly, uh, between 2009 and 2012, 2000 BAME people, that term. Uh, Black and minority ethnic people left, um, left the media industry. At the same time, 4,000 more people were employed. So that means for every one black or brown person who left the industry, two white people were employed. And that's stark. In London, where BAME representation in the media industry is at its highest in the country at 8.9%, the overall BAME working population is actually 28.8%. So, to give it some context, um, so me personally, I'm 35 years old, I know I don't look it, um, but I started in the media industry in 2000 and something, I was a runner for a documentary uh, uh, post house, which did a lot of work with BBC, and um, you know, I went there so that I could learn how to use broadcast industry standard uh, equipment and editing, you know, spend my weekends there, but at the same time we did a lot of socialising and uh, with the BBC, People and I think at one point uh, a friend, uh, a colleague invited a friend who's uh, at the BBC who recruits, and he, in a very unguarded moment, said that he basically recruits in his own image. You know, white male, middle class, privately educated, and went to a red brick university. Completely the opposite of me. You know, so I wasn't going to go into the BBC at any time. I felt, and you know, and like I mean, that's going back 13 years. I know they've tried all sorts of diversity measures since then, but. Um, talk about that another time. Um, but uh, also what you find is the higher up you go in a corporation, media or any other industry, the wider it gets. I'm sure you know this. And um, the BBC uh, and others, uh, but they're less uh, obvious about it in some ways, um, they love employing uh, interns, black and Asian interns, but you know, they rarely see as professionals. So all those people that left the industry, where did they go to? So, basically, I left that industry after maybe about eight months. I couldn't see a way forward, there was no opportunities. And, uh, but, you know, what did I, I went to work for a financial PR company after that, which was really strange, uh, doing events. Uh, but what was good about that is my lovely old boss, actually, you know, they're still friends, and he donated 12 bottles of wine to my launch company, but anyway. So, but uh, I got another job in the media two years later. But that was through nepotism, which is strange for a black person in the media industry. You don't get to use that as much as you have to uh, until we have a meritocracy, um, uh, which have as many opportunities as everybody else. You, you, you're white, middle class, privately educated, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, so a friend of mine who I'd gone to uni with sort of set me up with a job at Sky News Showbiz. Well, actually, was, anyway, yeah, I was doing videos, inter interviewing like, you know, three people a week, such as. Uh, Jordan, you know, Katie Price, blah, 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 blah. Um, so really challenging stuff. Um, but, you know, like, quite often nowadays, uh, so I'm talking about you know, uh, eight or so years ago, um, uh, nowadays you have to do internships, generally, to get into the media, uh, through economic downturn, blah, 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 blah. And so how do working class, black and Asian, and white working class people 
managed to find themselves through media to get into the media. It's very difficult. So I actually moved to Uganda in 2007, where I was initially working for a local production company. And then, uh, long story short, I uh, did my first documentary for Al Jazeera English in 2009, which they broadcast then. I would never have been able to make a documentary in London that, you know, where I was given a $30,000 budget to do, to do what I wanted to do with the film that I did, which was about three Ugandan um, rally drivers, women rally drivers. So, you know, that is quite drastic, having to move to another country. And you can ask me, oh, but are you from Uganda? No, my family are from Ghana, so I went to an East African country. Uh, but the thing is, at the same time, after that, I, you know, the, you get noticed, so I started doing breaking news for CNN. So I come to Kampala for me, landslides, blah, blah. But the thing is, as a black Westerner in Africa, I had a lot more opportunities than the local people who had far more expertise and more knowledge uh, than that. Because, you know, as far as I'm concerned, CNN thought, well, we've got a black girl, she's got a British accent, still an African name, let's put her on the telly. Ridiculous. Yeah. And, and so, um, so that is certainly a problem. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, CNN, so I said, I mentioned the Kampala boys, so I didn't actually want to cover it, but they, they asked me and they, <laughs> they, yeah, they, they kind of made me do it. Um, but the next day, uh, they flew in their correspondent from, uh, from Kenya, where they're, they're, you know, they're based, and he, he's a tall, white, privately educated, red, blah, blah, blah. And, um, you know, and, and most of their senior staff in that region are. Whereas you could have got, like, you've got Reuters and AP who do actually have black Ugandan or Sudanese uh, uh, correspondents there. And then, um, so, so that is a problem. I mean, even CNN actually called me in 2012, I was back in London by then, and asked me to, you know, give expert co comment on, on Coney. It's like, well, I've moved back to London. For one, I'm not Ugandan, I've never met Coney, so I give them a list of people, come on, you know. I'm getting the red card. So diversity um, for the media is about image, it's not about substance. I mean, last year I was called to, by ITN to ask if I go on Channel 4 News to talk about the situation in the Central African Republic. I've never been there, I don't know anything about it. Ridiculous. <laughs> but they literally said, we want a black woman to talk about CAR. <laughs> not me. Anyway, so <laughs> problems with the media industry also. So uh, after I got like, all these chances, I, uh, I got a commission for, well, kind of a commission for Deutsche Welle to go to Congo, where I did a story about uh, blood, uh, blood minerals, basically DNA fingerprints with blood minerals. However, these people were unwilling to insure me. Basically, uh, my first trip to Congo, they said, well, we'll pay you per minute for footage. We can't really properly commission you because, you know, if you die, we can't take responsibility of you. I mean, you, the, the, that's my first trip to Congo, and that's the advice I get from the <laughs> So, yeah, it's, it's a harsh industry. So, um, but, you know, I mean, I took my chances. I was very lucky. I was mean, born... Uh, in, in South London, black working class, lived in the council, lived, lived in the council, so I still live in the council today. Um, I was just lucky, I was a bit sort of foolish and whatever. But I'm coming to my conclusion, coming through all these experiences, I realised I needed to create a platform for black writers, a platform we controlled to put out stories from established and up and coming black writers, um, which, you know, to, but directly, without the filter of white dominated mainstream media. And so through my experiences, I saw black writers who have basically been exploited by the system, often not paid for their work, you know, for every intern. And so we, we established Media Diversified as a platform, but also an experts directory, which launches next week, filled with all sorts of experts, black, uh, black and brown experts, you know, I've got gynecologists in there, uh, barristers, all sorts. Um, and launches next week, and we will disrupt the stale male pale media landscape. Thank you very much. <laughs>
are too poor to participate ad adequately in society. We know the Oxfam figures that it's, we're just about to get to the stage where 1% of the world's population control 50% of the world's wealth. Britain, is it any different? Well, the 100 richest families in Britain have the same wealth as the, the so-called bottom, the poorest 30% of households. You're talking 100 families as wealthy as around 20 million people. Now, those are stark and horrific figures about inequality, but we have huge inequality, not surprisingly, in the media. We have the same concentration of power, wealth and resources that we see in other areas of, our, of life, reflected and structuring the kind of media that we have. Um, so it's not just about the banking, it's not just about concentration in big pharma, it's not just about concentration in supermarkets. We have this problem um, uh, across the media. You will know all the, um, the, uh, the figures, you've already heard some. Three, I mean, these are figures that you wouldn't be allowed to get away with in some areas uh, of public life. Three companies, mostly offshore, controlling 70% of daily circulation. One company, Sky, um, provides all the news for commercial radio. You have one company dominating pay TV. And is, uh, you know, is, is the online world any better? Well, it provides us certainly with opportunities, but actually, you think about Google's share, 92% of search. Think of Amazon's complete domination of, of e-books. You see these patterns of concentration reflected across both the online and offline world. Yet we're told that we have a free media, that we should celebrate, in fact we're lectured to by the Daily Mail and the Sun in their opinion, um, comes the whole time, uh, about the wonders of a free media. Well, I guess it's true at some levels. It certainly allows those companies to be free to attack immigrants, to attack women, to attack benefit claimants for being scroungers. It certainly leaves them free to support the wars of occupation, um, the wars for oil that we've that we continue to have. So it's a particular kind of freedom. It's freedom for the owners, and it produces a system that does not represent us, not in this room, not across the country, for reasons that you have already heard. It doesn't look like us, it doesn't speak our language, it doesn't address the issues that we need to know about, and far from being this liberal idea of the media being a check on power, it is way too, it's part of that, uh, vested interest. It's completely connected to the most powerful interest in this country. One pretty obvious example, if we had a completely free media, how is it, perhaps it's just a coincidence, that there was only one title that was able to articulate the nearly 50% of people in Scotland who voted for independence? Is that, is that a mistake? Is that an accident? Or is there something structurally wrong about the distribution of power inside the media? But the good news is, and I hope there'll be some good news today, a lot of it is, it's a bad starting point, but the fact that we're here is, is a positive step. But there is good news, which is, more, by and large, we do not trust these people anymore, if we ever did. Not surprising, a system that treats Nigel Farage as a genuine counterweight to, the, to Labour and the Tories. A system that celebrated the stock market and financial transactions as, as beneficial for everyone leading up to the 2008 crash. A system which never really called or investigated the role of bankers in causing that crash. A system that systematically, uh, to this day, and infuriatingly, uh, underrepresents anti-austerity views. All the time, one um, academic survey found that, uh, looking at the opinion columns of some of the alien newspapers, and it found that 60% of the voices quoted were mainstream economists, a giant 1% were from trade unionists who might have something to say about um, uh, austerity and how we should resist it. So not surprisingly in all of this, that we are starting or continuing not to trust the media system. It's something like 20% of the British population trust journalists. It's just above politicians and just above the state agent. And that is not a great place to be. I prefer to be able to trust journalists, but it's not until we get a system that tells us what we need to know, tells us the truth, is independent from vested interests, that we will ever be able to trust them. So what, what we need is a media that talks like us, that talks like a, the population is supposed to represent, and that tackles the real problems we face, not Madonna falling down the stairs, <laughs> not you know, the obsession with London Fashion Week and things like that. So I draw on 
uh, the work of some great Canadian media activists who organise an event just like this once a year in Vancouver. So you should get over to Vancouver to bring the solidarity greetings. Um, and uh, it's Media Democracy Day in Canada once a year. And their slogan is very simple, which is know the media, be the media, change the media. And in a way, that is exactly what today is about, trying to get to grips with our understanding of what has gone wrong. It's clearly reflecting all the incredible efforts of people who are the media, who are alternative, although we should resist that kind of voice, because it makes them sound legitimate and us sound like the fringe, when that's clearly not the case. Um, but we also need to think about how to change the media. And I just think we need all forms of action, together with producing our own forms of media. We need to work with others all the time to tackle and confront and call for action to challenge the abuse of media power. And that's a lot of different things. So that's whether that is direct action in the way that Donald has been talking about, whether that is direct action, working with others um, uh, around uh, making, it's a pretty popular slogan I would suggest, around making the Googles, Facebooks, Amazons pay the tax that they, sh that they have been long avoiding. We need to work with others to demand the ownership limits so that no single company should grow too large and too powerful for our craven politicians never to dare to stand up to. We need to work with others all the time to demand that newspapers that tailor their content to suit advertisers like HSBC, that they should be punished, that this is not an acceptable way of behaving in a so-called liberal democracy. We need to make, over the next couple of months, I think, uh, and it's going to be a pretty hard task, we need to make media ownership and the need for structural ownership reform an election issue. It's a scandal that only one party, the Greens, have, um, have embraced decent ownership uh, uh, reform in their, it, I imagine, I hope it will be in their manifesto, they certainly passed policy at their conference, but will any of the other parties either be interested in or be brave enough to stand up to the media moguls and call for something that we know will be a popular demand across this country, which is about standing up to bullies and standing up to people who don't pay taxes and so on. Well, we will see. Uh, if you're interested in how the election is being covered by the corporate media, I strongly suggest you look up a website called Election Unspun, which provides beautiful images of how the election is being covered, and you'll see that the kind of presidentialization is pretty endemic. It is about Farage, it is about Cameron, it is about a handful of individuals, and not about the real issues of poverty, inequality, and so on. And the, the final point, really, is just to say that campaigning works. What we do can make a difference, because if we don't do it, sure as hell, no one else is going to do it on our behalf. I don't know what your views are on the, the, the work done by No More Page 3. It hasn't got rid of sexism in the world, but the fact is it, it raised that issue about how women should be represented, and it was a pretty powerful argument that still needs to be, you know, it's still ongoing. But just a couple of days ago, we had what I think is a pretty amazing uh, victory. Am I allowed to use the word victory? Whenever you say the word victory, you, you think you're going to crash the next day. But in America, they, a huge public campaign composed of many millions of people working online and offline overturned the very rich lobbyists of some of the most powerful telecoms and cable companies and forced the Federal Communication Commission, by no means a left-wing organisation, to stand up for network neutrality, for net neutrality, and to make sure that the corporations aren't able to just divide up um, that the, uh, if you want to use the, met the old metaphor of the superhighway to the fast and the slow lane. That still is, we have a lot of work to do, but that was through sheer, persistent, energetic campaigning of the sort that we need. So I think that's what today is about, working with each other, celebrating the kind of work that, that leader activists are doing, strategising, making sure that we're on the streets of, of London, finding the best ways, at the same time as producing our own stories and narratives, we also do need, do need to work together to tackle the concentrated media power that, as far as I can see, has been absolutely instrumental in sustaining the terrible inequalities that have wrecked so many lives. So it's a hell of a job to do, but today is obviously a fantastic start. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. Um, it's the best-selling author and award-winning investigative journalist who broke the story on uh, Google being seed funded by the CIA and the NSA, uh, and that was funded through his new crowdfunded project, Insurge. Nafiz. Hi everyone, um, thanks for having me here. Um, lot to talk about, I'm not really sure where to begin. 
Um, how many of you are familiar with my experience with the Guardian? So, uh, so it's not a huge amount. Okay, so I'll start by talking about what happened to me in the Guardian, um, and then we can kind of go into some of the issues that have been discussed. So I, I've kind of been a kind of freelance journalist, academic type for about just over a decade or so. Um, long hard slog, uh, just over about well, nearly two years ago now, I got a gig at The Guardian. Before I was writing for places like The Independent, New Statesman, blah, 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 blah. Um, so I got this gig at The Guardian uh, writing for uh, the environment section. Um, and I was quite fortunate, I had a blog which I could basically publish straight to. I had editorial freedom under my contract. Um, and my background is in international security. So I was commissioned to write about the geopolitics of the environment. Um, and when I was hired, I was hired along with a team of environment bloggers. So the idea was that they would get all of these bloggers and they'd all be kind of writing about their different areas of specialism. It was a really cool thing. Um, so I was putting out uh, stories about, uh, which tried to kind of go beyond traditional kind of way in which the environment is viewed and look at how things which we don't necessarily see the environment in, the environment is definitely there. And as we, as we know, the environment is everywhere. You know, everything is about the environment, about energy, about economics, and all of these things are ultimately deeply intertwined. Um, so I was talking about things like Syria, Iraq, the rise of ISIS, and what's going on in Ukraine, and piecing it all together and showing how these issues like environmental crisis, geopolitical, uh, the geopolitics were all intimately interconnected. And that was all fine. Um, <coughs> then I decided to write about Gaza. And, um, you know, Operation Protective Edge started. And when I had applied to The Guardian, in my portfolio was a story I had done for Le Monde Diplomatique on uh, previous oper Operation Cast Lead. Um, and in that I had spoken about how um, Moshe Alon, who is now the Defence Minister in Israel, had written a policy paper just a year before the operation talking about the need to basically have a military operation in Gaza to remove Hamas, and that would be the only way to access um, untapped gas fields in the Gaza Marine. Um, which basically the, the, the British company, the British uh, BG Group, had uh, rights to that field and, and Tony Blair, the Middle East envoy, had been busily pursuing peace by attempting to uh, allow Israel to get access to this gas and trying to broker a deal. Which, you know, once Hamas was elected in 96, kind of scuppered that process. Um, so I decided to write about this stuff that was going on in Gaza and, and the gas issues and, and, and the new kind of competition that was going on. And I wrote a piece contextualising what was going on in Gaza. Certainly wasn't trying to make the case that everything going on in Gaza was about gas or about energy, which would be totally reductionist. Um, but it was in, it's increasingly an important issue in understanding the dynamic of the conflict in this direction. I got a call the next day from my, uh, one of my senior editors. And by the way, the account of this, you can probably Google it and find it really easy. I went public and I put it online. It was a very detailed account of all of this. Um, and my, yeah, he called me up, James Ronson of The Guardian. And he said to me, Afiz, um, I'm sorry to say, but this is not a proper environment story. And uh, we're gonna have to um, discontinue your blog. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> what? <laughs> what are you talking about? I mean, that was literally, it was just like, this is just, it just came totally out of the blue. Um, so that was my experience of censorship. And then obviously, I mean, once that happened, I mean, they literally, within the hour, they actually, you know, their rights manager contacted me and terminated my contract. And they did it illegally. The, they didn't have the right. Now, for me as a journalist at that point, you know, I was a lowly, you know, kind of effectively a freelance blogger with, with, a, with a freelance contract. With the Guardian, you know, and in that position as a journalist, you're kind of like, do I want to destroy my relationship with the Guardian completely? You know, what what is going on here? You know, what, do, what you know, what do I try to negotiate? You you find yourself in this situation where you really do not know what to do. Um, so I spent a month speaking to various people, trying to understand what happened, confused about what to do, not sure whether I should take legal action or not, if it was if it was even worth doing. 
I mean, I was talking to some journalists who were like, if you try to take me to a tribunal, you'll probably never, never write for the Guardian again. I was like, oh God, God forbid I can never write for the Guardian again. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what I was thinking at the time. And in the end, um, I reached, a, you know, to cut a long story short, I reached a decision um, where I decided that I, you know, I didn't need to worry about my relationship with the Guardian and I would prefer to go public. Um, so, I mean, what that illustrates, I mean, there wasn't a lobby. This was not the Israel lobby or something. This was the Guardian. Uh, I spoke to journalists who told me that there was a culture, journalists inside the Guardian, who said there's a culture of the Guardian of um, being this kind of pro-Zionist culture that had been established since the newspaper's inception. Um, and what, what the, the argument was, was not that there was a big structural kind of, not that, not that there was a kind of set editorial line, but rather that there were kind of invisible walls that editors would kind of know that there are certain things which basically we just really don't talk about. What you'll notice is that before I wrote about Gaza's gas in the context of war and Israel's wars, military operations, there was not a single article in The Guardian that had ever discussed this issue in that context. And there probably won't be a single one afterwards. That article on Gaza was the most popular and is today the most popular article on Gaza ever on The Guardian website. And it's just like had some ridiculous, it was went nutty viral, but crazy amount of shares. Um, and yet that's how they, they dealt with it. So why? Why are we facing this you know, strange kind of, I mean we've seen over the last couple of weeks with the HSBC scandal and Peter O'Born's revelations about the Telegraph and then we've seen the ensuing farce where the Telegraph then starts running exposés yeah. of the <laughs> medium, the Guardian is, they didn't run something because Apple said don't run it, you know, I don't know, I mean, I don't know how plausible some of those things are given the Telegraph's, the politicisation of the Telegraph's desire to expose these things, I think some of them do seem plausible. Some of them perhaps less so. And then, you know, then we had the smug responses of the Guardian. Oh, look at the Telegraph. Look what they're saying. It's ridiculous. <laughs> oh, we're, we're the Guardian. We're going by the Scott Trust. And that was kind of funny because Owen Jones, who's, you know, a lot of respect for Owen Jones. He's a great journalist. Um, and he does great stuff. Wrote a naive little column advocating um, <coughs> about the brilliance of the Guardian um, and how the Guardian is owned by the Scott Trust and therefore it's much more independent. Um, and what he didn't say is that the Scott Trust is not a trust. The Scott Trust in 2008 was changed into a limited company, like any other limited company, a profit-making company. Um, you know, and so, so I think there's a lot of this kind of mythical stuff about The Guardian and the liberal kind of media. And it's what we're now realizing, and I think there's a been made very clear here is that there, you know, there isn't a huge amount of difference. I, I do think the Guardian and the Independent can be somewhat better in their coverage sometimes, purely because of their ideological leanings, perhaps. Um, but there's a huge amount of stuff that is not being covered. I'm right now working on another story about HSBC and how HSBC has ripped off consumers in Britain to the tune of something like one billion dollars of fraud. Um, and every single media company um, in Britain has suppressed this story. So there's been a lot of this kind of like, look, we covered HSBC, mm. amazing. But no one covered this story in Britain and there are political reasons for that because of the implications of exposing HSBC's operations in Britain and the massive ramifications that could have on HSBC's ability to operate in Britain and the United States and the reverberations that could have around the finance community in terms of the demand for regulation and accountability. What I want to do, what I want to close by saying is the reason I think we're seeing a clampdown in the way the media is operating recently is because of the crisis that we're facing. We've heard about the environmental crisis. We've heard about the crisis of inequality. We've heard about um, the, you know, the crisis in politics and the corruption. Um, and all of these crises are part of the same problem which is fundamentally, we have, our planet is owned and controlled by a tiny minority of people who are exploiting the commons 
for their own benefit to maximize concentrations of wealth. And in the process, they're raping the planet, sending us down to this path of suicidal annihilation. Um, in that context, however, the system is dying. Everything that we see happening now is not from a position of strength. And it can sometimes seem like that when you're looking on the outside from where we are. But it's actually happening from a position of increasing and escalating weakness. In every possible sector you look at, when you look at fossil fuels, when you look at the environmental sector, when you look at the banking sector, what we're seeing here is a crumbling, dying system. What we saw in 2008 was only the beginning of that. We're going to see more financial crises. We've seen an ongoing uh, austerity and economic slowdown. The recovery has been not a recovery at all. Um, and that kind of problem is escalating. The people who run the show are worried. They're worried that as these crises escalate, and as many documents and planning documents show, they are worried what happens when those crises hit and people go out on the streets, because they know that people are going to get angry. And that's why it's even more important for them to create these narratives that divide people along race, religion, ethnicity, because they need us to be pointing fingers at each other and not at them. And that is why the gathering like this is so critically important, because whatever it takes, we, the, the solution is going to be information. Because one of the key things that came out of my Google story was that the whole reason they have been co-opting tech companies like Google and Facebook is control of information. It's the last thing that they have, apart from military power. Military power, information control, that is the plank of war today. So we need to have an information revolution. We need to basically begin to create new narratives, new visions of what society can look like. And we need to be able to empower people with the realization that the highways of information, even though there's an effort to control them, are inherently and increasingly decentralized. And in a sense, these guys are fighting a losing battle. So I'd just like to basically say it's a pleasure to be here and be part of this conference. And uh, I'm pretty sure that we have an opportunity here to plant the seeds of something that can take the system on once and for all. Thank you very much. What did you leave out? And that tells us more than what they put in. And also at the point where we have such a poor relationship with our local newspaper that I would direct them to the blog rather than even send them a press release because they're just going to completely ruin it and not take the right information out anyway. And again, go to the comments under the stories that they do and put the full press release in that so that people can see what the truth and reality was. But then also, like, you look at individual journalists who are doing fabulous work and you wonder, how does that work? How do you see the future? for media in the sense that like I go to Twitter, I have a list called Trusted Journalists. So when I want to read my day's news, I go to that list. Bad and bias is much longer and a lot of fun, but it's just not going to give me anything good. But how do you group and is there a need to group and is there a need for titles and publications still? And how does that work when it's full of individuals we trust, you know, that we learn to trust because you've not let us down yet? And how does that work and how does it look for media in the future? Um, yeah, just very quickly, I'll just, uh, I mean, I think, in my view, I think you're absolutely right in terms of the decline of the media. It's one of the things that we're seeing is that for, it's, it's a matter of fact, I mean, look, I, I actually don't pick up a newspaper in print anymore. You know, it's all going to be looking online, we will go online. I don't think many of us will buy physical newspapers. I mean, even, even people who are, are much older than me and are used to, like, they like doing crosswords and things, like, they'll tell me that they might buy the Sunday paper or the weekend or on the weekend, but not even during the week. So. Print is declining in that sense, but more than that, it's like my kids, they just don't, well, they, they not, will never read a newspaper. They, they, it's just going to be online, and, not, and, and not even just online, it's going to be on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, that's where they're seeing the stuff that interests them. 
So there is this decentralization and fragmentation going on, and people are looking for what they want. But that can be problematic in a way, in the sense that, you know, for, for us in terms of the challenge of how do we, in, how do we, how do we insert ourselves into that? But I think we're, we're looking at this, there is this massive transition, and what you're seeing is all of these big conglomerates in so many different ways, and I mentioned like fossil fuels, the banking sector, the media sector, all of them are facing massive challenges across the board. You know, bank, bank, conventional banking is facing problems from things like Bitcoin, uh, all these kind of new electronic ways of doing transactions and all the rest of it. Whatever the pitfalls of these are, these things are accelerating massively out of their control. It's the same with the media. There is a massive opportunity here for us to be able to create credible, people owned. And I think the key thing here is about have people having a media. People are pissed off with the media because they know that you don't have any stake in this. But if there is something like real media or whatever that people have a stake in, that's where they'll go. And I think that's the key. I, mean, I think what we'll see in the next couple of years is, find, is finding new ways to use technology to, to team up, have journalists work together using crowdfunding, using digital technology to find new ways to create interesting platforms. And I think it's, going to, it's a really exciting time and the opportunity is here and all we need to do. And, and I think lots and lots of people are already taking that opportunity. Yeah, I just want to say every word you said was fantastic. Every single word. If you, if you send out press releases and so on, do exactly what, what, what is the uh, woman did. What is your publication? Oh no, we're not. We're, we're bike racking and, and kind of occupied. What's your blog? What's your... Oh, it's the um, Nellis, Residence Against um, Bile Fracking. Okay, you should go and look at her website, it sounds fantastic. But I just wanted to come on to that um, and say that we, as an organisation, started a hashtag on Twitter uh, a couple of days ago, and it's called The Trashies. It is the newspaper equivalent of the Razzies in Hollywood. It's inspired by two columns that were published earlier this week, one by Grace Dent in The, in the Independent, and one by, actually two by Emma Barnett in The Telegraph. The second of which she called us uh, fake this, phone this, blah 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 blah. Literally, and she and she 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 didn't mention me by, by name, but she did say. And somebody said I'm not qualified to talk about ISIS. Which at that point I sent her the bio of a terrorism expert called Rash, Rashid uh, Singh, who is very much qualified compared to Emma Bonner. We are using this hashtag to highlight bad columns that have been published since 2013 because we want the media to fix up, as in stop punching down and stop getting things wrong. Um, and we think by highlighting bad journalism uh, in all its, all its var varying forms, and they will, I mean, with our account on Twitter, we've got hundreds of journalists that follow us, like the editor of their, I think, the, well, The Guardian, everybody in anyway. And so people will read that hashtag, they will, they will, they will, you know, we'll, we'll certainly get trashed ourselves about it, but like highlight bad examples of journalism and show this, you should not be replicating that. The second point I want to make is to the fees. That HSBC uh, article sounds fantastic. I'd love to have it on our platform and we'll pay more than the Guardian would. <laughs> Take your question really quickly. Okay, um, I'll skip the point. I was going to make a quick point about lobbying. Uh, as you know, a few years ago, the Chief Tory Treasurer was caught selling influence, peddling influence for hundreds of pounds. Now, every single policy and act of parliament should now be the first question any journalist should ask is who's bribed for this, who's lobbied for this, okay? Uh, they call it cash for access. It's not a policy for sale. Cash for access is a disinfo term, okay? But my question was actually every journalist I meet, I ask them as they read back the uh, news. Most of them haven't, and most of them, when I talk to them about this and that and the other, not going around from it, but they do seem to be 
not massively up on kind of world events and economy and history, but my question is what's actually going on at graduate level and postgraduate level in journalism schools? Is it that they're just taught how to interview and how to edit? But like, what's going on in the world is like, well, that doesn't matter. Well, they're not adults, I can promise you that. <laughs> um, in terms of objectivity and impartiality, it's a tricky question because objectivity is used as a deliberate strategy to confuse, to distort, so that you just have objectivity. It depends where you start from. The objective cover of Israel and Palestine assumes so much that you know you take the position um, of you know you set up a camera inside Israel. And then that's the starting point, and it completely kind of skewed objectivity. On the other hand, we don't want, that we know there's a lot of pressure to get rid of the broadcast rules on impartiality because a lot of people, very powerful people, want a fox. They want the foxification of our broadcasting. So it's quite a tricky argument. I think you just have to use your ingenuity, use the passion, um, use the most, you know, the, the voices that you have access to. To uh, just to make their case. But first of all, I don't see you know, Ofcom is going to come crashing down at a time like this. You know, I hope I'm not wrong. But the fact is that you know your biggest strength will be just articulate, giving expression to people whose voices are kept off the airwaves. And if they want to come for you, well, there's people in the room who are going to support you. The second point I wanted to make was just about the opportunity of digital. It is true. I guess it's trying to come back on you, on you nappies. The opportunities for us presented by digital are clearly there. But let's face it, the opportunities are also there for giant corporations. It may be true that fewer and fewer people read the, the, the printed press, but just because you get a story from Instagram, just because it's done, you, know, you get it through Facebook, it does not mean that the source of that story is not the mail. The mail has used these technologies just as much, what well, more than you've been able to, to make itself the world's most popular online newspaper. And even if it is the case that they are a dying breed, a dying animal, we know that wounded animals can be quite dangerous. So I wouldn't in any way want the consequence of what you're saying be to suggest that media power is, some, you know, is on the wane because we have these new technologies. The fact is that the press releases you're talking about it is true that it helps good activists to demonstrate the lack of objectivity inside the, the, the corporate media, but it also um, allows for journalism, precisely the kind of thing that Samantha was talking about from Nick Davis, which is the fact that we know quantitatively that an astonishing amount of our daily newspapers are filled with direct reproductions of press releases. So it's a battle, and there's nothing inevitable about who's going to win despite social media. Okay. Yeah, um, just about the future um, of media. Uh, I think it's a, a really important to realise that the web is not uh, the answer to all our problems. As you just said, 70% um, of the news hits already are to the billionaire press on, online. So, um, and that's right. The only major news outlets online that are successful are BBC and The Guardian. They have a bigger presence there than they do in the printed press. So it's a little bit better than the printed world, but the, the billionaire press are, are gradually getting there. I would like to just make an appeal that we stop using the phrase, talk about the future of the press. Let's stop calling, referring to it, as um, somebody else said. That there is, the mainstream press is not the mainstream press. The mainstream press is a right-wing, extremist, billionaire press. It's a long phrase, but it's useful. <laughs> But as remember, every time you refer to the mainstream press, you are giving away our power. You're saying five billionaires are the mainstream. It's only five people. We can take them on. There's 60 million of us. Let's wait. <laughs>